Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to Endeavor Silver's conference call and webcast to discuss its acquisition of the Pizzeria project. As a reminder, all participants are in a listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Trish Moran, Interim Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for today's announcement. Before we get started, I would ask everyone to view slides two and three of our Pitteria acquisition presentation to view our cautionary language regarding forward-looking statements and other important disclaimers. On slide three in particular, I would like to point out the language around historical resources. It highlights the fact that Pitteria's resources must be referred to by Endeavor Silver as historical because the resource estimate predates the acquisition. Our slide deck is available on our new website at edrsilver.com. To, to provide you with an overview of the acquisition, on the call today is Dan Dixon, Endeavor Silver's CEO, and Dale Ma, our VP Corporate Development. They will be making formal remarks, and as well, we have with us today Don Gray, our COO, and Christine West, our CFO. Following their remarks, we will open the call for questions. And now over to Dan. Thank you, Trish, and hello, everyone. Uh, we'll move into the presentation to slide four, and, and um, we'll move through the presentation as we go and speak to the presentation. Uh, but we're excited about today. Uh, today marks another key milestone for Endeavor. <clears throat> we are very pleased to announce that we signed a definitive agreement to acquire the Pizzeria project from SSR Mining. We are one of the last few primary silver companies, and Pizzeria is one of the largest undeveloped silver deposits in the world. There have been comprehensive work done by SSR to advance the project, and ultimately, as they rationalized their portfolio, it became an opportunity for us. This acquisition is an excellent fit for us. And we believe Pizzeria has the potential to provide Endeavor shareholders with another opportunity for long-term value creation. Moving to slide five, Pizzeria has a historic M&I resource of 525 million ounces of silver, grading close to 100 grams per ton, plus material amounts of lead and zinc. To put this into context, Endeavor's current mineral reserve base is 86 million ounces of silver equivalent, with M&I resources of 44 million ounces silver equivalent, golds being our equivalent, a big gap. As Trish noted, we are treating this resource as a historical resource under 43101 guidelines. We have a lot of work to do to advance this project, and it starts by defining a current 43101 resource. Over the next couple of years, Pizzeria will be a major focus for our exploration team. In terms of value for our shareholders, Pizzeria, together with Terranera and Perel, will form the key cornerstones of our long-term growth profile. On its own, we believe Pizzeria will be accretive on a silver equivalent resource per share basis, provide optionality in a rising silver market, and help us maintain high exposure to silver. Slide six outlines the details of our transaction. As released, we have agreed to acquire all the outstanding shares of a subsidiary of SSR that holds the Pizzeria concessions, permits, and infrastructure for the project. The $70 million purchase price is comprised of $35 million in Endeavor Common Shares and $35 million in either cash or shares at the election of SSR and agreed to by Endeavor in the case of shares. At the end of the third quarter, we reported more than $100 million in cash and nearly $130 million in working capital, which doesn't include the fair market value of the bullion we accumulated and held at cost. On closing, on a pro forma basis, SSR will own less than 10% of our company if the total consideration was paid in shares. SSR will also receive a 1.25% NSR royalty, where we retain the right to match any offers. The transaction, which is expected to close in the first half of the year, is conditional upon receiving approvals from the TSX, the New York Stock Exchange, and the Mexican Federal Economic Competition Commission. Turning to slide seven, Pizzeria is located in Durango State, which has a long history of mining and known as a mining-friendly jurisdiction. 
with several other operating mines, including our Guanacaste mine. Hatteria is well situated, approximately 160 kilometers north of Durango City, where Endeavor's exploration office and team resides. It's easily accessible with excellent infrastructure, including access to the power grid. A number of key permits are already in place for the underground mine, mining and development, inclu including permits for water use and discharge, general use of explosives, and change of soil use. As well, underground mining and development are permitted under an environmental impact statement. While SSR categorizes it as a development asset, we are viewing it as an advanced exploration project while we define a current resource and conduct comprehensive verification work over the year. Now over to Dale Ma, our VP of Corporate Development, to give our listeners an overview of the potential of Paterio. Dale. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so um, just going ahead to slide eight now. I, you know, before we talk about rocks, I think it's pretty important to understand the history of, of Pateria. Uh, but first off, just congratulations to the SSR team. Uh, what they found here in 2002 is, in my view, a, a world-class deposit. It was a grassroots discovery stake by SSR, which is important to point out, since we acquired it unencumbered. That means essentially there's, there's no streaming agreements, no royalties other than one that we just granted. Uh, there's no previous mining, no tailings liabilities. It's just a very, very clean asset. And since the discovery, there's been over $140 million spent and over 227,000 meters of drilling. Uh, all this drilling kind of results in a very well understood deposit model. So, not you know, trying to get too technical, uh, you know, geologically speaking, Pitaria it's an intermediate sulfidation epithermal system. So, on slide eight, there you can see on the right hand side of the uh, of the slide, uh, the cross section sh shows the main rock types that are present. The blue rock down at the bottom, those are the marine sediments. Uh, above that is the green that labeled conglomerate. So that is the most important rock type. And overlying that, there's uh, you know, shades of oranges and yellows, and those are just kind of more recent volcanic rocks. So essentially, what's happening here is that depth, you can see those three uh, near vertical structures in that um, red polygon. Those there are the feeder veins that brought mineralization up from the depth. As the fluids encounter the kind of the porous permeable conglomerate layer, the mineralization spreads out. Um, so we, what we're seeing there is massive sulfides and uh, strata bound replacement mineralization. So this horizon, this conglomerate horizon, is typically 25 to 65 meters high and can be up to 400 meters of lateral extent. It hosts the highest grade portion of the deposit, which was the focus of SSR's 2009 underground PFS. On to the next slide. Slide nine. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see those feeder structures again, and they extend all the way to the surface. As they cross the volcanics, mineralization becomes a bit more disseminated, uh, but they're all vertically extensive veins with soft works. So it's important to note that mineralization does extend all the way to the surface, as you can see by the drill traces there. So, um, and again on the right-hand side, of the, that's the aerial view. Uh, this shows the surrounding area. So Pitaria's historic resource estimate, that's in the center of the map inside that black oval. It's approximately one and a half, or 1.3 kilometers by 600 meters. Um, so you can clearly see the exploration potential in the area. There's at least probably six areas that are around it that SSR discovered and drilled and discovered mineralization. So Havelina Creek, for example, is up in the upper right. Um, you know, drilling back in early 2000 that hit a, a hole, the best hole, or one of the best holes there was a 77 meter interception of 110 grams per ton silver. And on the opposite side at Corte of Colorado, that returned about 60 meters at 130 grams per ton silver. And then on to the next slide, 10. So this gives us a kind of approximate timeline. So moving forward after the transaction closes, our focus will be on confirming this historic resource and developing some drill targets. So we fully anticipate that by the end of the year, we're going to have a, a current mineral resource estimate that will lead to um, an economic analysis. We're not sure what's, what that's going to look like at this point, but it's safe to say we're going to evaluate all options, uh, whether it's open pit underground 
Um, we'll just see whatever makes the most sense for the company. Uh, so now back to you, Dan. Thanks, Dale. Turning to our last slide, and um, obviously we're very excited today. Uh, Pizzeria is a world-class asset and world-class deposit, and we think it's going to fit really well to our, ourselves. And over the last three years, we've developed an attractive uh, portfolio. In Mexico, we have two production assets, Juanes V and Bolognese. Each performed very well last year and exceeded the upper end of our production guidance, as we announced earlier this week. Our development project, Terranera, is advancing. Within the next couple of months, we expect to receive committed financing followed by board approval to proceed with construction. And we have Perel, a very exciting exploration project in Chihuahua State where we've defined over 40 million ounces of, of silver and we've resumed drilling there in 2021 with a lot of success, ultimately advancing towards a preliminary economic assessment. We also recently acquired the Brunner Gold Project, an advanced stage exploration property in Nevada, and we're advancing our early exploration properties in Chile. This acquisition of Pizzeria further enhances our development pipeline as we focus on organically growing our current asset resource base. Our exploration team have a phenomenal track record in growing our resources through the drill bit, and we expect this to continue. Pizzeria, together with Terranair and Perel, will form the key cornerstones of our long-term growth profile. Pizzeria is an excellent addition and has the potential to accelerate our vision to become a premier senior silver producer. So we've given a lot of information here to digest for our listeners in quite a short time. I think it's best to open up for questions. Operator? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, please press star, then one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. We will pause for a moment as callers join the queue. The first question comes from Heiko Ile with H.C. Wainwright. Please go ahead. Hey, Dan and team. Thanks for taking my questions. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great, Heiko. Happy to take your question. I appreciate that. Thank you. First one, no less. Anyway, um, you hinted at this a little bit earlier on the call, but walk us through the geopolitical factors that you see in Durango, please. I mean, in, in general, the state seems to be quite positive on mining. There's obviously skilled labor. You know the state very well. But maybe just a bit more granularity. Uh, do you Have you talked to a local government? What's the community support at site like? I mean, I've obviously never never been to the site, but... Uh, you know what? What are what are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, Durango is one of the better states from a mining jurisdiction in Mexico. And Mexico itself, as a country, is a great jurisdiction for mining. Um, the long history of mining in Durango. There's a lot a well trained workforce uh, throughout Durango. There's a number of of assets that are operating and. Ultimately, SSR had done a great job in the community and, and working with initiatives with the group. Um, from a government level standpoint, we've had nothing but uh, positive communication with the governments with regards to Guarantee City. We haven't touched base, obviously, due to confidential information, but uh, our experience in Durango is things will go relatively smoothly. There's always things that need to be worked through and challenges, but uh, that's what we do as a mining company. As far as infrastructure in the state of Durango, it's easy to get to. Um, we do have our exploration office in Durango. We do have our exploration team based out of Durango. So being only 160 kilometers, we obviously sent out our exploration team. We're excited about it. Um, looked into all those items of concerns from a geopolitical standpoint uh, in our due diligence leading up to this acquisition. And we're very comfortable being in that state. You did a wonderful job talking about due diligence leading up to my next question. Um, how was the purchase price established? Were there internal models built? Was it just, uh, you know, a dollar per ounce? Just, I mean, I don't know how much you can discuss in a public setting like this, but purely out of curiosity, how, how, how exactly was this valued on your end? Yeah, it's a fair question. Sometimes hard to answer. It's, a, it's formulaic, of course. I mean, we've looked at other deals that happened in, in the space based on ounces, based on the scope and scale of the project. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of projects in the world 
with 525 million ounces of silver defined in its deposit with lead and zinc. And um, it's looking through the historical PFS, the 2009 one from an underground standpoint, looking at the optionality of the open pit uh, standpoint. Um, so it's uh, it, look at it from an accretion standpoint. Uh, it was a competitive process. SSR did a good job and we felt like we had to go uh, with our, our our best foot forward to be able to acquire Pizzeria. We thought it would be transformational to the company long term. And um, there's a number of measures that we looked at, Dale's worked on. Uh, we did use PI as an advisor to help kind of develop the, the right offer for SSR, so to speak. But um, there's just a number of things that go into it. Nothing specific that I'll dilute now. Got it. Yeah. And, and I just add to that scale here. Um, you know, we, we might not have been the highest number, but um, you know, we have we do have a good relationship good relationship with SSR. Um uh, defensive deals with them in the past. And so uh, you know, valuation is one thing, but it's also just, you know, choosing a the right partner. So we're 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 excited that they chose us and um we're looking forward to uh moving forward. Yeah, well, they're going to be a pretty meaningful shareholder. Um, and, and just a clarification, I'm pretty certain I know the answer to this. The, the matching rights to repurchase the NSR has no minimum or maximum dollar amount. It's just, it's just a, a role for essentially at whatever the market price that they can get is, correct? Exactly. Okay, that's how I understood it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ico. Good questions. The next question comes from Joseph Rieger with Roth Capital Partners. Please go ahead. Hey, Dan and team. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. No problem, Joseph. So um, a couple things. I guess the first one, uh, I mean, you kind of partially answered this already, that there was a process being run here for this asset. But, you know, how long, you know, have you guys – you maybe had your eye on this asset, knowing that there might be a process at some point that SSR might be moving in a different direction. Yeah, I mean, obviously SSR has gone in a different direction with their merger with Alistair and it's effectively the Alistair management team there. And I think when when that occurred almost last year, um, a lot of people in the silver space would have kind of looked at that and was curious what was going to happen with some of the assets. I mean. Pizzeria has been known as one of the crown jewels in the silver space back till 2009 to 2010, and obviously with with where silver prices went in the in the in the last decade, it, it took a pause. But um, when that came available, and and ultimately when we got involved, which was late last year, and um, kind of a process started in November December, but it, it went relatively quickly for us once we got into discussions with SSR. So. Um, it's like I say, it's one of those assets that you always have an eye on. It's just when it, when you, something like that can shake out, we want to be opportunistic and and we're happy that we were able to to be a part of it and ultimately acquire it. Okay, and then you know, it from the press release, it sounds like this is going to fit in in between Terranera and Prowl. Is there anything we should read into there on Prowl? Is it you know, lessons learned from smaller projects like El Compass that you guys are going to just aim bigger going forward? Is it timeline yeah, to yeah. potential production? You know, how how should we look at what this means for the existing the existing asset in the, in the company? Yeah, it, it, that's a very fair question, but Peral and El Compass are com- two completely different assets. I mean, we're looking to grow Peral to be about 60, 65 million ounces and ultimately looking for about 2,000 tons per day. If we can get that into an economic assessment. And Peral delivered some really good drill results this year, and we're expecting that resource to grow. And ultimately, at this point, I wouldn't say Peral's behind Pizzeria. We're, as an exploration team, we're going to look at it. We're going to allocate some funds this year to Pizzeria to be able to prove out that current resource. But Peral will continue, and we'll do a preliminary economic assessment on Peral this year. Now, what comes first or what in the second, I think that just depends on where we're at in, in the current climate and where we're at at the end of the year. We're going to push Perel forward. We're going to push, push Pizzeria forward. And ultimately, I think the results of those projects and those studies will dictate which comes next. 
Okay, fair enough. And then one final thing. Um, there's a couple other assets out there that there's been some speculation they may also be on the market, and this particularly in Mexico. Is this kind of, you know, fill you guys up on a project portfolio basis to the point where you aren't looking for anything else, or, or is M and A still, you know, top of mind, uh, you know, with this acquisition and with the the smaller gold project in uh, in Nevada? Yeah, I mean, obviously we've got only so much capacity, but at the same time, I would say we're never closed. Dale's still got his title as VP of Corporate Development, and his job still get projects. And it's no different with Pizzeria. We weren't looking for Pizzeria, but you had an eye on it, and we thought we were being quite opportunistic. And it's a, a price that's accreted to us and that we liked. And if another project comes out uh, and available and something that can be accretive to us, absolutely we'd look at it. And Obviously, you don't want to build too much of a pipeline and create capacity issues. And um, but if we can add something that adds cash flow, of course, uh, we'll continue to look. Okay, thanks. I'll turn it over. Thanks, Joseph. The next question comes from Mark Reichman with Noble Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my questions. So I was just curious how you might be thinking about the incremental annual exploration expenditures associated with this project and your goals uh, with respect to the updated current resource estimate and then eventually publishing a, a PEA, PFS, and or a, P, or a feasibility study. Yeah, it's a fair question. This year, in sorry, in 2021, we had a budget of about 12 million in our exploration plan. And for 2022, we're going to come out with guidance next week, but ultimately a very similar exploration um, budget to 2021, where we're going to have to reallocate some of those funds from the other projects and into Petria. But I could see anywhere between one to two million dollars this year to prove out the current resource. Now, getting into an economic study and the scale of the economic study is we just been through some for Tarrant Aaron. You're probably looking at another one to two, almost three million dollars, and that would occur in 2023 with continued drilling. But we'll have to define that over the next kind of 90 days before we close on Pizzeria. Um, but we have the resources in house to be able to do that. We do have operating cash flow coming from Bolognitos and Buena City. We have a very healthy balance sheet. When it comes to Terranera, we're still working on our debt package that we expect to close here in the next 90 days. So we have sufficient resources available to us to be able to push the three up forward. Yeah, and I'll also add, um, you know, with $140 million of historic exploration spending, um, it's not as if we have to, you know, drill another 200,000 meters to prove up a resource. The resource is large, and we know it's there. Uh, so a few select holes and, and right areas, and we'll be able to bring that resource current. So it's basically just fast-tracked exploration. And just uh, pivoting to kind of valuation, I mean, you have two producing mines, so some investors, you know, will value Endeavor on a DCF basis. But with a large and growing portfolio of currently non-producing assets, do you think investors should be more focused on enterprise value to resource? Every investor is going to have different metrics to how they value the company. And uh, for us, we have a list of different metrics that we look at. Discounted cash flow is one of them, but also resources in the ground is another. And it's a combination. There's no right or wrong answer with one or other metric. It's just what's comfortable with that and that investor. That's just my way. Yeah, and I would also that it would be easier uh, with a large, a large resource. So, you know, if you followed Endeavor for a long time, we've had these uh, two, three-year mine lives that just kind of keep on rolling. Um, but with Terran Air, with 12 years on it, and then uh, Pitoria, you know, even if you look at, it's too early for us to say, but even if you look at the last study, those are 15-plus-year mine lives. Um, so looking forward, I would say, um, you know, you look at a company like Endeavor Silver, two uh, long-life uh, mines along like assets it's close we'll call them um you know we could be mining till 2040. Well, that, that's very helpful uh thank you for that and then the, the last question is is uh you already talked about some of the mining permits that are uh, exploration mining permits that are in place for this project and i was just wondering if if you could just uh talk a little bit about 
the ones that are that would still be needed and also maybe elaborate on the collaboration agreement uh, in place with the local community. Yeah, from a permitting standpoint, uh, there's still a ways to go. They do have a development ramp that goes in about 800 meters almost to the deposit but hasn't got to the deposit, which is important because it does. it is their EIS that allows them for mining and development. Uh, water discharge, explosive permits are there. Now, until we know what the scale of the production is, all those permits would have to be renewed in due course and have extensions on it. And particularly don't want to get into details of what permits are there because we have to go through and see what type of project we have. And then ultimately with those permits, they'll probably have to be um, not reapplied for, but uh, amended to what we want to do. Uh, as far as the collaboration agreements with communities, it's the local jobs. Um, there's a there's a small town in the area that we have we're working with or they've been historically working with, um, but it's all related to job focus when once the mine comes on. Okay, thank you very much. It's very helpful. The next question comes from Cosmos Chu with CIBC. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Dan, Dale, and team. And first off, um, Happy New Year. Um, happy New Year, Carl. It's good to hear from you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, maybe my first question is on, I don't know if you can answer this, but, uh, you know, I'll ask anyways. Um, you know, clearly Pitaria, it's gone through a number of iterations uh, in terms of technical reports. What levers can, you know, Endeavor Silver pull uh, in terms of optimizing it? You know, in the past, I think uh, at one point in time, CapEx was a bit large, and so they talked about the scale. Um, there were always questions about open pit versus the underground. Um, to the extent that, you know, you can share with us, um, you know, what, what can you do beyond what SSR mining has done? Hey, God, it's uh, Dale here. I'll, I'll take that question. Hi, so, Dale. I, guess, I, I think it's important to uh, just understand the history and how this project evolved, right? So. When it was discovered in 2002, and they proved up a good resource uh, between 2003 on to 2009, when the pre-feasibility study came out, <clears throat> and the price of silver went from four dollars to probably you know ten, fifteen dollars, hmm. and then the only thing that worked back then was the, the higher grade underground resource, and so that's uh, that's what that's culminated culminated in 2009 the pre-feasibility study. Um, but by the time 2009 feasibility study came out, uh, silver started moving again, up to 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars even. Hmm. And then you think, okay, well at at 40, 50 dollars silver, all the upper oxide uh, silver, those ounces suddenly work now. So then in 2012 they they, they switched gears and put a fe that feasibility study in that made the uh, the super pit. Um, it was large and it was massive. Um, but it held a lot of ounces. And then naturally, again, shortly after they put out that feasibility study, then in 2013, probably mid-2013, kind of silver probably started, you know, taking a, a dive down to the $20 level. And mid-2013, up until just last year, silver was uh, basically range bound about $20 or so, 50, between $15 to $20 for, you know, those six years. And mm -hmm. so then the... You know, uh, you know, we, we refer to back to their 2012 feasibility study. It didn't really work at $20 silver, and so, yeah. um, you know, for us, it was no fault of SSR. It's just you know, this timing and timing in the markets. And so, I think for us, um, you know, we, you know, Dan and I are very analytical. So when it comes to us, when we evaluate the project, uh, we're looking at what's the best way to, um, you know, study this. Um, underground open pit, you know, we'll, we'll just do our, do our, we'll evaluate, we'll do our methods, we'll put them side by side and whichever makes the most sense. Obviously, the ones with the lower capital um, would, would make more sense, right, in, in today's market. I think the, the whole appetite for super pits out there um, mm -hmm. is, is kind of is kind of gone. Everybody would like to see more, uh, you know, fiscal responsibility, keeping it small, keeping it real. No sense for us putting out a a billion dollar capex project when you can do something that's, that's smaller and and works 
for today. And, and ultimately, in that feasibility study from 2012 with the open pit, it was an $800 million capex. And very difficult in the contracting silver environment to be able to raise capital um, to do that. And I think for us, it gives us fresh eyes for SSR at this point in their life cycle as a company from a, and a rationalization of their portfolio. Their focus on gold, and ultimately, this is likely going to be again at these prices, potentially more of an underground looking back to that 2009 pre feasibility study and going something with that scale. Now, again, I have to go through this whole process of making those studies, but that, that point of having an underground operation that's got lower capex up front, something that's more bite size or doable for a company our size, is probably the way we're going. But uh, if we're right on where silver prices go three, four years from now, we'll look at everything Cosmos. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, remind me again, if you you know are to just go underground, it wouldn't cannibalize the open pit eventually, right? I forget. It's been so long. No, actually, well, there's been no uh, mining there at all. So, um, you know, if you start underground, there's nothing saying that after, you know, conceptual 10, 15 year mi underground mine life, there's, there's nothing in there that says, oh, you can't uh, turn into a cave and then and turn into a pit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe, you know, stepping back, uh, a bigger picture question here. As you talked about, you know, the history, there's been many different uh, technical reports that were put out for uh, Pitaria due to the fluctuating silver price. Um, again, I don't know if you can answer this, Dan, but, you know, what kind of silver price would you would you use to analyze this? Would it be spot price today or would you be a bit more conservative and go a bit lower? Like, how how would you you know, conceptually think about it. Yeah, it, it, to be honest, it's slightly lower than we are today, even though that we do expect a rising silver environment over the next three to four years. Um, I, I think once we get there using similar 20 to $25 range and right we're around those prices with what we'd use, but again, we have to get there. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then one last question, um, you know, in terms of timeline, uh, okay. Glad to see that it was in your presentation, but could you give us a bit more, to the extent possible, a bit more granularity in terms of, like, what are we talking about? Is it potentially five years out? Are we talking about more like ten years out in terms of production, or, or you're not, you're not sure yet? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately prices will partly dictate all that, but we think it's something like five years out, and obviously for 2022 we'll be drilling and proving out that resource. In 2023, some studies, and likely 2024, more studies. So um, you're not talking about construction until 2025, and then it depends on scale. If it's underground mine, maybe it takes two years. If it's no pit mine, maybe it takes longer. So um, you're looking at the five to six it your range if everything goes well and then prices work out well for us. But um, that's early, and it's still pet speculation at this time. Yeah, and conceptually, we have one de good development team. And so the next two years are going to be tied up at Terran Air. And so, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, picking up Pitaria here is, is a great asset. So once, Pitter or once Terran Air is built and it's online, then we just kind of take our development team, slide them over to Pitaria, and, and let them go from there. So um, it, it mm -hmm. slots in quite nicely. Yeah. And then maybe one last question. I don't know if you've thought about this yet, Dan, but, um, you know, in terms of financing, uh, clearly um, Pitaria could be a, a game changer, as you talked about long mine life, you know, scalable and, and everything else. But how would you how would you finance it? Have you have you given it any thought? Are you you know going to need debt financing once again, or or have you run the models to the extent that you know potentially uh, internal cash flow could uh, could help you build it? Um, yeah, we've looked at it. I mean, at the end of the day, the capex from the open pit is something that we had, we would it's be completely game changer. We'd have to do something completely different than what we've ever done from a never from an underground standpoint, where it's more bite size and uh, you're looking maybe somewhere in the three hundred million dollar range rather than eight hundred million dollar range. Is something we can do, but that just comes down to Terranera and, and the cash flow that we're getting from Terranera comes down to what the markets are looking like with the size and scale of Endeavor, whether corrals come on prior to the three, if we're advancing that. Um, it's just sheer speculation of how we finance it. Clearly, we'd have to finance it, but if there's debt markets available to us, if there's the equity markets available to us, we have to look at it at that time. But 
right now we don't even know what that capex number would be to what would need to eventually be financed um, obviously over the history of endeavor we've always looked at everything um, to every different function of finance we've had corporate debt facilities before we've obviously done equity it's a normal course for a junior mining company and all that stuff would be on the table moving forward the good mm -hmm. news is Guanas Civi and Balneos with the cash flow. Guanas Civi's got a really nice long mine life and de delivering good operating cash flow. And Terran Air itself, um, once it's in production, using the prices that we had in our PFF, uh, and current prices around now is about $50 million after tax. So uh, Terran Air itself will give us significant cash flow. Would it be enough to develop Pitaria? We have to get through all those studies to see where we're at. Mm -hmm. Of course. Thanks again, Dan and Dale. Those are all the questions I have. Thanks, Cosmos. The next question comes from Ben Whiting with Oryx Minerals, Inc. Please go ahead. Buenas tardes, mi amigos. I think that your project uh, at uh, getting La Pitaria is an excellent fit for Endeavor Silver, and I think that the knowledge that you have of the geology of that region uh, is certainly a good fit. My um, questions that I have, the first one is um, your, the price that you quoted was the $70 million, uh, but there's also the 1.25% NSR. What sort of value should we be considering for the NSR uh, when we're looking at it from, the, from SSR's viewpoint? Uh, they're getting the shares and the cash and the uh, net smelter return. What sort of value would you put onto that? Yeah, if you look at uh, SSR's news release this morning, they valued it using the 2012 PFS. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't recall the price, maybe $25 silver, but they valued it at eight, I'm discounted at $87 million. Now, I think that's a headline number. Right now, it's not a mine, um, but that would clearly be undiscounted. Um, everyone's going to have different ways to value that, Ben. And, um, it's going to come down to the probability of one day whether Pateria will be a producing asset, which we think it will be, but what's the timeline on that? What's the scale of that? Um, it's doubtful it's going to be a super pit um, at this point, but you never know. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with leaning away from the super pit. Um, with your expertise in underground mining at Guanas V and elsewhere, um, that the underground seems to be the most um, appealing part of it. Uh, the areas of Cordon, Colorado and Havelina uh, tend to be more uh, oxidized material as well. Um, would you be looking at focusing on open pit for those areas or the underground as your first stage of evaluation? Yeah, good question, Ben. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, but back on to the royalty thing, I'll just touch on that as well. Um, you know, it, it, in this business, you're only worth what somebody's willing to pay, right? So if somebody, if SSR is, or gets a, if somebody approaches them and says, hey, we want the 1.25% and we'll give you X on it. Well, it's, it's kind of up to them. Um, whether it's, they do it, you know, tomorrow or after close or just before, um, you know, a, a announcement of construction, for example, right? So, so it's, uh, it's, it's how long is a piece of string valuation kind of thing on the NSR. So we won't really know until it happens realistically. Um, now on to your question about the oxide. Get good question. And uh, yes, you're 100 percent correct. Havelina and Cordon are uh, oxide resources, um, and it, it does like from the surface it's oxide. So it does have the full spectrum of oxide, sulfide, and transition in the middle. Um, if we were to go simple, um, you know, flotation. That, that's what I would I would do. I would target the, the high grade sulfides. Um, in which case the oxide resources uh, will probably not make it in. Um, yeah, that, that's probably the easiest way to put it. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And the, the last question would be, uh, when's our next fishing trip, Dale? Uh -huh. I don't know, Ben. Last time I was on a boat with you, I think I spent about six hours of it throwing up. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm a prairie that, boy. My, my feet are designed to be on flat, solid ground. And, and, a, and a best of luck and success to you and the whole team at Endeavor. Great call, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. 
The next question comes from Henry Westendarp, a private investor. Please go ahead. I guess mainly I have a comment that congratulations, people. This is a game-changing scale of transaction you're doing here, and the amount of silver in the ground is hugely substantial. And in a way, what you have here is an option on the future price of silver. So uh, supplementing the other questions here, I think that you've done a major thing, and I have no questions. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. I think we're in agreement. Um, we are excited today, and we're excited about this asset. I mean, like we say, it's one of the world's largest undeveloped silver assets, and it's in a backyard to where we have a lot of experience. So uh, we think it's a big day for Endeavor, and we're excited to share this with our shareholders. Everything fits. Have a good one, guys. You too. The next question comes once again from Mark Reichman with Noble Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thank, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on, on one of the questions that I asked earlier about the exploration. Um, you know, I, transactions like these always generally come with some kind of minimums on exploration expenditures. And, and I think in this case, it's uh, $10 million over over five years. Um, and so I was just kind of curious, and those always, it seems like companies always, you know, spend obviously in excess of the minimums, but uh, so do you see the, the minimums, I mean, do you, how, do you see that, uh, you know, becoming like more back-end loaded? I mean, if you're talking kind of a six-year time frame to trying to get this developed, it seems like, you know, you're, you'll probably incur a fair amount over those five years, but uh, was just kind of curious a little bit more, a little more detail on kind of how you're thinking about exploration and then, you know, is that maybe one of the reasons in terms of like your other projects like at Terranera and, and Peral, um, Dan, are you kind of looking at exploration like kind of as a kind of a fixed budget unchanging and just kind of moving the parts around or, or would you expect, you know, exploration expenditures to, uh, uh, to go up a little bit? Yeah, it, it, first off over the, the 10 million over the five years, right now in our heads, it's, Kind of linear. Uh, that's going to change as we get through it and, and prioritize between Chile or, or Nevada or Corral. Um, but at this point, we're thinking linear. And I, I think you're right. Like as of right now, with the scale of our production and the cash flow that we have, we do have a, a capacity of an exploration budget. And since I've been in Endeavor now almost 15 years, it's been anywhere between six million and 14 million, generally averaging about 10 to 12 million in that range. And, that's what we spent last year, and it's really an allocation and moving moving funds because obviously we went through budgeting process for 2022 back in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, and now we're having to relook at that and, and reallocate funds. And um, so it's a portion of reallocation and maybe an increase in overall exploration budget, but just based on what we have going on from an operation standpoint, what we want to do with Terranera, we do have capacity and a limit on expiration. So I'd say over the next two years, it's, it, it, it will take away some maybe from Brunner, some maybe from Chile uh, as we prioritize, but I don't think it will hinder any of those programs for what we have to get done. Well, it certainly looks like a good fit uh, for your portfolio. So congratulations and, and thank you for the call. Oh, thanks, Mark. Like I say, we think we're excited. And we think this is a Perfect fit for us, like I say, based on location and, and what we've historically done and, and what our exploration team's capable of. Um, it's Dale back here again, actually. Um, ben, if you're still on the line, just to, just to follow up on your oxide uh, question on Avelina and Cordon. So if you look at the drilling that on um, what's this slide uh, nine, um, the, the oxide drilling, the oxide resources that SSR found at the, at the top, is they're really shallow. And um, they just didn't really drill it very well to depth. And we know from some of the sections that that conglomerate layer, um, that basal conglomerate does extend underneath. So there always is that chance, there's always is that opportunity that the mineralization does 
uh, extent to depth and turning the salt pipe down uh, closer to that basal conglomerate. So what SSR did, what they did do there actually is um, an underground ramp. There is about a 700 meter long underground decline. Um, and so if, if we get access to the underground, which it is accessible, that's five by five. So once you get underground, we start doing some more underground drilling and just try to delineate more of those um, uh, sulfide zones. Because it'd be odd to have a, you know, one system that pops up and drops 500 million ounces of silver and just kind of that's it, right? So it, it's a big system. We know it's a big system, so there's there's a good chance that there's more around. All right. So that's the next question. Our next question comes from Ryan Thompson with BMO. Please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks for the update. Uh, I think most of my questions got answered, but um, I haven't had a chance to pull up the 2009 technical report yet. Could you kind of just provide a, a bit of a high level overview of some of the parameters in, in that report? Um, maybe just with a focus on, on the resource. What does the underground resource look like in terms of uh, tonnage, grade, uh, average width, uh, all that sort of stuff? Sure, yeah, it's, um, Daniel here again, I, I can answer that question and it is just to, you know, just to clarify, it is, this, this is on the 2009 PFS, it is, you can download the whole entire report off of the SSR uh, website or even off of CDAR. Um, but what it was, it was a 4,000 ton per day underground operation. Uh, it had a 12 year mine life. Um, the average grade of silver only was 171 grams of silver. So that's just silver only, not equivalent. I believe the equivalent on that is lead and zinc, but I believe it's about 4% combined lead and zinc. Um, recoveries were good. Again, it's all it's all fight flotation. So the recoveries were good. Uh, lead recovery was 90%. Uh, zinc recovery was 93%. Silver recovery was 88%. Okay, perfect. That's helpful. And I, I'm not sure if I caught the number, but I think uh, Dan mentioned something about $300 million as the sort of initial capex on an underground scenario. Yeah. Is that a reasonable number to yeah. be thinking about? Yeah, yeah. the okay. 2009 uh, feasibility study by SSR is, uh, I think the capex on that was 285, okay. 290, call it 300. But I'll say, though, that is, yeah, the, the mining method that they... Um, chose was uh, room and pillar, so it's big bulk underground. So again, uh, one of the things that we'll study with our engineers and our development team is, you know, can we be more selective, maybe go smaller, um, smaller tonnage, higher grade, I would say, but uh, that's, that, that's just to put that in context. Perfect, no thanks, that's, uh, that's helpful. That's all I had, guys, thanks. You're welcome. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Dan Dixon for any closing remarks. Thanks, operator, and thanks all our participants on the call. Uh, clearly, um, a big day for Endeavor, and we're excited to again about Pythoria. We are going to have our guidance news release come out likely next week for 2022 with regards to production and our expiration budgets. I'll put out some more detail on Pythoria and what we plan to kind of allocate towards Pythoria for 2022. Um, again, fits in extremely well to Endeavor's portfolio. It pairs extremely well with Terran Air and Perel, and ultimately right in our backyard with our exploration office there. And we're excited to get to work, get this closed over the next three months, and tuck it into our portfolio. So thanks again for listening, and stay tuned for further events. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating and have a pleasant day.